Uh, up next, we have Brian talking about postmodern CSS. Uh, Brian joining us from Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, he's been creating handcrafted experiences uh, on the web his entire career. His experience spans from large content-driven news sites to boutique uh, designs for small to medium businesses. He's currently making a living as a free agent, a developer evangelist for technologies he's passionate about uh, with his startup company that he founded, Code Contemporary. In the past, he's led agency design and development teams, been a front-end developer and a UX strategist. Uh, Brian also hosts the That's My Jamstack podcast, shout out Jamstack, uh, streams live code and uh, design daily and runs multiple developer groups in his hometown of Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, his talk today is about CSS. CSS has changed. It's moving away from the mirrored mess of its origin and toward a bright future of interesting layout and easy design. If you've been focused on other important skills in the past five years, you've missed out on a lot of new helpful techniques, including Flexbox and CSS grid layout. Everyone give it up for Brian. Take it away. Awesome. Well, thanks for that awesome intro. Let's get the, uh, the screen share moving here. Hopefully you're not going to see too much of my awful, awful desktop. Uh, so yeah, so today we're going to be talking about postmodern CSS. Um, what Max didn't mention in that awesome intro is that I consider myself a free agent developer advocate, developer evangelist. But what I do is I advocate and I evangelize for uncool technologies. Uh, so I write and record a lot of stuff about CSS, which I know a lot of developers struggle with a little bit. Uh, I, when I write JavaScript, which I do love JavaScript, I usually write vanilla JavaScript instead of doing a React or a Vue or a Spelt. Uh, and beyond anything else, I also just really, really love HTML. I love the Jamstack. I love static sites. So yeah, I'm just, I'm really boring. Like I, I understand that. And so today I want you to be boring with me. Uh, I do want you to get super excited for where CSS is today and where it's going in the future. And so I do want to go ahead. And if you're watching on Twitch and all that, go ahead and put something in chat. Let me know you're here because I'm all about like, getting some energy from the audience. So I do want to make sure that I am going to get that as well. Um, but before we get started, one other thing that's not in my bio that I gave Max is that I have a degree in philosophy, not computer science, not design philosophy. Uh, and that is with a concentration in aesthetics. So in a nutshell, I kind of, I just overcomplicate and think about things in really weird ways. Hence, postmodern CSS. Uh, so postmodern, right? Like Andy Warhol, like some soup cans on a uh, on a canvas, kinda, right? Like that is postmodern art. It's pop art, but there's also a whole bunch of other stuff involved in postmodernism. There's postmodern architecture. There's postmodern um, um, film. There's all sorts of postmodernism, and there's also a branch of philosophy called postmodernism. So that's really what I'm talking about here. I'm going to talk about two different definitions. Uh, first is from a, a person named Jean-Francois Lyotard, which I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunciation of his name. Uh, and he was a prominent postmodern philosopher. Uh, and in this quote, he defines postmodernism as an incredulity toward meta-narratives. So the meta-narratives that he's talking about are things like the hero's journey. So like what we see typically in a lot of different, um, a lot of different, stories told through the ages, also like coming of age stories. Uh, and really what it is, is it boils down human experience into like these broad categorizations. And the postmodernists really were rebelling against that idea. They were rebelling against this idea that you can distill human nature down into like five different categories. And so they, they kind of view it as, as life is much more complex than that. And so in the end, postmodernism is also an expression of a society that's kind of grown skeptical of these narratives as well. Like we know that the hero's journey is much more complicated than that. And then this other definition is from Miguel Sajuco, uh, another postmodern philosopher. Uh, and he actually defined uh, postmodernism as basically a direct uh, reaction to what was called modernism at the time, uh, modern art, modern philosophy. Uh, whereas those were all about objectivity, postmodernism was all about subjectivity. It was all about a multiplicity of truths as opposed to a single objective truth. Again, life is much more complicated uh, than 
what maybe modern philosophy, modern art wanted us to believe. Uh, so why are we talking about postmodern? Why are we talking about philosophy when we're talking about CSS? And I like to give a very brief history of what I consider to be the eras of the web uh, and also the eras of CSS. Uh, so if you're not a child of the 80s like I am, you might not have experienced a lot of these things. I got a chance to live through a lot of this uh, and really struggle with my, uh, with my computers in the early days. So I like to define it much like I would define historical eras, right? So we had a, a set of prehistory, the 70s and the 80s. It was all about bulletin boards and point-to-point -point connections. You literally dialed into somebody else's network and all that good stuff. Uh, the internet as a thing was much more based around research, sharing documents, and really, again, just kind of accessing those simple networks. But then we found some enlightenment, right? We moved into the classical era. Sir Tim Berners-Lee, not at the time a, a knight of the British realm at that point, uh, invented HTTP, the HTML language, and the first browser, the World Wide Web web browser, right? The very first web browser was literally named the World Wide Web. Uh, and so we come into this era, we are able to share things, we're able to access it, not just researchers are using it, it's really good stuff overall. Right, but then, like all society, like all civilization, we do usually enter a dark time, the Middle Ages, uh, the Dark Ages, as we might refer to them in the uh, in the actual classical sense. Um, I like to refer to this, you know, how you've got like the the rise and the fall of the Roman Empire. We also have kind of the rise and fall of CSS, and we're going to go deeper into that in a minute. But I'm going to gloss over it for now. And we're going to move on to the modern era. Things become much much more easy, much easier to use in the modern era. Right? We have HTML5, we have CSS3, we have advanced JavaScript, all sorts of great frameworks. We have Bootstrap, we have Foundation, we have these things that make our lives very, very easy, kind of across the board. Right, But we also see some things that we might not like, and we'll dive into that as well. But in post-modernity, right, coming out of that, that modern era, I like to think that our future is all about super advanced layouts, re-emergence of unique designs, not necessarily even like great user experience, although there's plenty of room for that as well, but like punk rock, like that was a big postmodern kind of thing. So let's actually talk about our postmodernity. Again, here's that quote from Sajuko. Uh, it is about a reaction to objectivity. It's about seeking uh, um, subjectivity. So what is our objectivism on the web, especially around CSS? So this to me is our objectivism. Every website looking almost exactly the same. This is actually like the only bootstrap page is the name of this of this little site. And it's a very familiar look and feel. Lots of websites look like this. And I'm not gonna knock it because it is a very useful design. It is very easy for users to use and it doesn't take us a lot of work to put together. But every website in the world looks like this. So this is kind of our objective truth around what the web is supposed to be, right? Not necessarily what it could be, not necessarily what it should be. So again, going back to the postmodern definitions, um, what is our meta narrative, right? We have a meta narrative, especially around CSS, and it is that CSS sucks, um, says every developer ever, as uh, as referenced by this awesome GIF of Peter Griffin, Griffith trying to uh, close some blinds. And I love it. And usually this would be the point that the audience would laugh and everyone would kind of have a good chuckle. So go ahead and give me some, some lols or some raffles in the chat and, uh, and we'll go from there. We'll, we'll pretend like I heard you. Uh, so yeah, so let's actually dig into why most developers think CSS sucks. Because it doesn't and it's awesome and I'm gonna prove it today. So the rise and fall of CSS, our middle ages, our dark ages. And really what it boils down to is there's a battle over Style sheets, browsers, implementation, all that. Thank you for the lols in chat, I appreciate it. So why did we get here and, and where can we go? So CSS started really, really strong actually. So in the mid nineties, mid to early nineties, uh, people were thinking, all right, HTML is not quite enough. It is a very semantic way of structuring a document, but doesn't really take into account the more marketing-y things that we want to do on the web. More people were adopting the web, we saw a whole bunch of stuff happening in terms of like simple layout in HTML. So people were like, all right, we need to be able to style this stuff, not in HTML, let's separate our authoring languages out. So uh, I'm gonna again, kill these names, but Pecan William Lee and Bert Foss started working together on the CSS1 specification. They were actually competing specs at the time uh, for how you would handle styles. And the reason that CSS1 as a specification was actually because there was a belief that users were going to add a style sheet to their own browser and they wanted to make sure that that last style sheet 
could override uh, a site's styles. And so that's why we had the cascade. We want that cascade. We want the user to be able to implement things to override our stuff. That's why browser extensions work. That's why this is still an important thing. The cascade is still super important today. But 1994, they start working on the spec. 96, the CSS1 specification is complete. And by that point, IE3 kind of adopts it. And by 2000, 99% of that specification was in IE5, which was probably the most prominent web browser of the time. Um, so yeah, about six years from start to finish, and it all kind of was implemented with very few bugs, nothing to worry about. So we start out strong. The middle part, not so much, right? So 98, they have all these new ideas they want to implement. And so they start working on the CSS2 specification, the level two specification. And it actually enters its first working draft in 98. And then in 2000, so just two years later, just like that CSS1 spec, it becomes a recommendation. And so it's like, all right, browsers, you can start implementing this. This is good to go. But then between 2000 and 2007, it literally went back and forth between recommendation and working draft like five times. Uh, and that's not great if you want browsers to support the actual real specification. And that's why we have so many bugs in like older browsers around these implementations, why floats don't work exactly the same way, why widths and paddings and the box model is kind of different between IE6 and IE7 and Firefox, or I guess it was still Mozilla at the time. But that's why we had these weird things because the specification didn't reach maturity until 2007. And in fact, it reached maturity not as CSS2, the CSS2 level one or CSS2 revision one, so CSS2.1. So all that back and forth really muddied the waters around how browsers were implementing it. And finally, by 2011, we had it fully published. So it's really, was that 13 years of back and forth and figuring the specification out. And what we got was kind of a, a like I said, a mired mess of, of what the browsers implemented. So the future and why CSS3 is better than CSS2 or 2.1, or even CSS1 at that point, is because we've gone into this module system. So now when we talk about CSS3, we're not gonna talk about CSS4, we're gonna talk about different modules gaining traction, going through working draft and into recommendation on their own so that the browsers can implement smaller pieces. So you can see here, we've got like selectors level three and four for all the new cool selectors we get, grid layout, multi-column layout, Flex is, is in here too, image stuff, all these things can go on their own process and the browsers can implement little pieces. So it's a really cool philosophy that they've adopted and it's gonna make things hopefully less buggy going forward. I think you can even see how that works with the fact that when Grid launched uh, three or four years ago into, into the first browsers, um, there were very few bugs. There were bugs, but way fewer than what we would get from like floats and box sizing. So if you're curious, there are a couple other things you can read about like this whole evolution of CSS and the saga. Do, do Google, Google search on these, the CSS saga, the evolution of CSS, they're really cool uh, historical artifacts for how all of this worked. But that's not really why you're here. You don't really care about the history probably. I care about the history because again, I think about things very oddly, but you want to get into the new hotness, right? Why is CSS awesome? What are we going to do today? So my goal for you is I want you to today or tonight or tomorrow after you've kind of gotten over all the new stuff you learned today, adopt at least one of these properties and, and shoot me a tweet or something about it and let me know uh, what you decide to adopt. But we're gonna go back and forth between some graphical things and some layout things. Uh, and so I wanna start kind of easy. So we're gonna talk about CSS gradients. So back in the day to do gradients, we'd have to do like image crops and slices and then background repeating and stuff like that. Why use images when CSS can do amazing things out of the box? So very important, always think about how many browsers support it? The cool thing about gradients is that they're supported across the board. The, the kind of light green is there because there's some multiplication errors that you get from uh, Safari uh, around some, I think they call it uh, pre-multiplied colors in the transparent keyword. So there's like a bug, but it is fully supported. It's about 98% support worldwide uh, for the CSS gradients. So let's do some gradients for fun and profit. Here's the simplest implementation that we've got. We've got it gradating from a light red to a dark red, and it is in syntax, a background image. It is not a background color, it's not a background, it's a background image, and that's because the browser is actually gonna be rendering uh, uh, an image behind the scenes for you. So it is actually an image, and it feels weird when you first write that the first time, but you get used to it and you, and you know that it's actually an image back there. Uh, so yeah, it takes a, a function in CSS as a value. It is a linear gradient for a linear gradient, linear dash gradient, and then it takes some number of, of arguments. So in this case, it has 
the starting point for our gradient and the ending point, so light red to dark red. But you can also control the direction at which it goes. And you can use a whole bunch of different values for that first argument. Uh, in this case, I'm using the degree unit in CSS, specifically meant for angling of items. Uh, you could use turns, you could use, um, uh, there, there, there's no, uh, you, and then there's some keywords we'll get into in a second. So you can direct the way that your uh, gradient is going. You can also control how many stops you get. So you can see here, uh, instead of a degree, we're now getting some keywords to bottom to actually direct our, um, our gradient from the top of the browser to the bottom of it. And then we get a starting point. We get the next stop where it says we want to be fully at the dark red color by the 50% mark. And this goes for any length unit in CSS. So percentages, rems, ams, pixels, anything you want there, it will render out. And it's basically where the next color should be fully implemented by that point. And then you can add as many color stops as you want along the way. Uh, and so in this point, we, we say, we wanna go back to that original red by the 70% mark. And that gives us this kind of like dark gradient stripe in the middle, which can be super handy for making things legible in various ways. If you don't like lines, you can also do a radial gradient, which can give a nice deal of depth to your page. Uh, and so the syntax is very, very similar. So it takes a, it's another function, radial dash gradient, takes some parentheses, and then takes those same two colors, the starting point and the ending point. In this case, the starting point is going to be in the middle of uh, our radius, right? So in the middle of the page, and then the ending point goes out from there. You can also do a few different things with what kind of radial it is. In this case, it's a circle. You can control where it's positioned, where that center point of the circle is positioned. So in this case, it's up there at the top left corner with that 10% zero declaration. And again, just like we did before, you can also give it a length unit of some sort to actually see where that dark red color gets in. You can also do some intense stuff with repeats, and it doesn't have to be a gradient, as it turns out. So here's something, again, you might need to shield your eyes because it might be a little harsh for you, but we have stripes. And this can actually be like very, very powerful in terms of like maybe not quite this harsh, but like using this as backgrounds can add a lot of texture to your page. So in this case, we're doing a lot of stuff. I'm gonna break it out piece by piece, but what we're doing is we're calling the repeating linear gradient function. We're telling it what direction to go in, right? To top right. And then we're providing the stops along the way. And let's break that out real fast. So again, first we get direction and then we take that first color, which is our light red. And then we're gonna do the first color again at 20 pixels out. And that's going to give us a hard edge on the left and right hand side of it, instead of actually having it go as a gradient. It's no longer gradiates between the two, it's now a hard edge. And then at that same point, at that 20 pixel point, we introduce our second color. Again, so we don't get any sort of fade, we get a hard line there. And then to fight the fade on the other side, we then double that. So we say, all right, at the 40 pixel mark, I want you to still be that same color. And because this will repeat, it goes back to the first color directly after that. So again, you get that hard line in there. So gradient stripes are awesome. They are apparently Spatsfire's uh, spirit animal. So yeah, I love, I love the syntax. And it's a good like way, it's a good appetizer into what we're doing here today. But you're probably interested more in layout. And I can, I can completely understand that because part of what people think CSS sucks at is doing layout. And layout has been hard. And that's why we've got as many frameworks as we do. So Flexbox gives us truly responsive, flexible, unidirectional layout, and it is completely and utterly supported in all browsers we tend to care about. Uh, if you need to use it pre-IE 10, don't use it because IE 10 is first where we get it. IE 10 and 11 has some, some decent sized bugs in there as well as some older version of Safari. I'm not gonna talk about those today, but there is a website you can look up called Flexbugs. It lists out all the different browser implementation issues across the board. Let's talk about syntax. So. Here we have some tomato, which is my personal favorite CSS color on light blue. So we've got six boxes. This is the way the browser typically renders, right? We've got block level, they stack down the page. They are 100% of their container. We're gonna set up some simple styles. We've got a 510 pixel wide box. We've got some margins to do some centering, light blue background, and again, a little bit of, of extra stuff on our boxes. But then to get them to go side by side previously, so before Flexbox, we would use floats. So all I've done is add float left to the code, and this is what we get. And everything's side by side, and that sounds great, but what happened to our light blue? Well, because floats are intended to have text wrap around things, our heights collapse when you use floats, and so the parent element, the container, doesn't know how tall it should be, and so it has a height of zero. 
So we implemented a whole bunch of like different hacks to make this work. This is the clear fix hack. You can use an after element, set content on it, display block, and then you clear left and right. And that makes it so that there's an extra element in there that identifies where the float stops and then makes the browser actually render our blue background. Then we have to do a whole bunch of math, right? Our box size math. We've got a container that's 510 pixels wide. We need to divide that by the six boxes we've got. So we get a box width of 85 pixels. So that should get us all six boxes side by side, right? As it turns out, no, not so much because of the way box sizing works in CSS by default. It is an additive process of that padding. So we're actually adding 40 pixels left and right to that width value, and it's no longer what we actually expect it to be. So we have to do more math, gosh darn it. And we have to say, all right, our container size is 510 divided by six, and then minus 40 pixels on each of those to get the actual box width we need. So we can do that, and that gets us our six boxes side by side. Uh, we can do that either with that width calculation, or we can say width 85 pixels and use a new property, which I'm not going to dive into, called box sizing to tell we actually want that to be a subtractive element, the padding to be subtractive on it. And that allows us to have a max width basically set on those elements of 85 pixels. Uh, so you can go either way. Um, the math is kind of the old school way of doing it. Box sizing border box is obviously a little bit better. This is why we use frameworks. This is a terrible thing to have to work through and floats were never intended to do the complex things we do. This is why Flex was created. Same example, right? Six boxes in a container. We want to get them side by side. So on our container, we change its display value from the default, which is block, to display flex. And by default, we get all six boxes side by side, sized by their content, right? They're sized by the amount of space those numbers take up and the padding. So this works out great. We don't have to worry about the math anymore. It is handled for us by flex. And then if we want them to stretch to fill that space, we say flex one, and that's going to allow it to grow. It's actually a, a shorthand for flex grow, flex shrink, and flex, um, I lost the third, it's, it's the percentage that it kind of starts at the flex something or other. Uh, I don't really go that far into it because I believe the grid is more important than a lot of that stuff. But we have these six boxes side by side. We don't have to do any math, super handy for us. And the great thing is if our markup changes, our layout changes by default, right? Those elements stretch to fit the space available to them, the white space available to them. So we get rid of those three last three boxes and we get three side by side instead of having them be like 50% of the box. We can also go in and we can add additional boxes. And as long as there's space for the content of them, there'll be space for them in our flow. So we get seven boxes instead of six. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do, including like wrapping things and stuff like that in Flex. Uh, definitely worth looking into. Uh, let's talk about Flex layouts and that Flex grow property or that Flex property. So if we wanted to do two third, one third layouts, which is a pretty typical flow in, in terms of uh, layout on the web, we can do that with the Flex values and we can say Flex two, for the box on the left to make it two thirds. And we can do flex one on the right hand side. And what this does is it sets up a ratio of the different flex units that you've got, right? That ratio is gonna be, uh, it's gonna add all this together. So we have three units, which are unitless units, which is fun. Uh, and it's gonna say that two thirds one needs to be two out of three units. And the one third one is gonna be one out of three units and it gets us two third, one third. We can also use width plus the box alignment module, which has justified content and aligned items. Um, and we can set widths on these. We can say like the left-hand side is 65%, the right-hand side is 33%. And then we can say on the parent, justify my content to put the additional white space that my boxes don't take up in between. And so as we stretch that white space in between them grows. It's super handy. The justify content property has a whole bunch of things you can do with it uh, from space around, space between, evenly center, flex start, flex end. They look like this. Uh, if you if you don't add the uh, the flex one value, you can actually have them spaced out in this way. Um, so yeah, it's super super handy. You can also do a lot of things with height, which would have been just the worst thing to do in the float era, right? So very similar code, uh, but we actually increase our height of our container, right? I'm saying 60 bhp, 60% 60 of the browser's height, and you can see by default our two third and our one third items stretch to fill that space. So super handy. Uh, and just like in Just By Contents, we have a whole bunch of different values we can use. I don't expect you to remember all these things. Somebody mentioned actually in chat, there's a great CSS Tricks uh, guide to Flexbox and it's amazing. I actually have it as a link in the slides as well. Uh, but it does all these things. You can actually align things to the end of your item, which is super handy. I love that. That is so hard to do before Flex. So super, super important. We can also do some directional changes. Uh, by default, Flex things go in a row. 
We can also reverse them by doing row reverse. And we can also change them to be in a column instead and still gain all of our cool box alignment module properties by using it. So column and column reverse. So boxes one through six, then reverse to boxes six through one. Important thing to note, this doesn't change your markup. It doesn't change the source order. So screen readers will still read from one to six in this case. We can change it to column and we're gonna get a column of our things here. And then we can use just by content to change the way that it works uh, vertically and horizontally at that point. So a lot of cool things that you can do with it. Uh, those are my main use cases, just because Grid has taken over a lot of the things I used, used to use Flex for. Uh, but you can definitely check out more stuff. Flexbox by Animated GIF is a great resource that shows all those box limit properties and shows them moving around. Flexbox Froggy and Flexbox Zombies are great gamified experiences for learning all the properties. And then as mentioned in chat, uh, CSS Tricks Complete Guide to Flexbox is amazing. So I sped through that because I only have a limited amount of time. Uh, let's, let's cleanse our palette a little bit. Let's go back to the graphical side uh, and ask the question, can browsers replace Photoshop? And as it turns out, we kind of, they kind of can. They've got background blend mode. There's also something called mixed blend mode, which allows you to do it not on backgrounds, but that's something to research on your own. So support for it, it's very, very well supported. 94% uh, globally is a great amount of support. Uh, IE11 and the older non-Chromium-based edges don't support this. So support it, but with an eye towards readability. So if it fails, you still want the user to be able to read whatever text you might have around it. Um, so let's take some kittens because we we're in a palette cleanse mode in between our layout sections. We have a grid of kittens, right? They've just got a little bit of CSS to make them a grid. They've got a background size cover to stretch the kitten to the entire box. A uh, place kitten goes in there. And then there's also already a background color of purple on it. But until we add a background blend mode, only one background can take effect at that point. So background blend mode takes a whole bunch of things, uh, a whole bunch of different values, a lot of which you would see if you were to like do a background and select or a, an opacity and select inside of Photoshop, a lot of those are in here. I am not a math expert, but basically what these do is these change the way the pixels interact with each other, foreground to background. There's a whole bunch of different cool stuff you can do. Uh, I highly recommend like reading about these things in like Wikipedia. They're super complex though, and I'm not great at math. So here are those kittens again, and here they are with a background blend mode attached to them. There are some super cool kittens now. Color dodge, uh, screen, overlay, multiply. Uh, we, had to use, we used to have to train our designers not to use these keywords in Photoshop, and now we can use them and it actually ends up being pretty cool. We can change the background color, right? So instead of purple, we now get orange kittens, green kittens, gray kittens. This is actually a great use case uh, for uh, darkening a background image and putting text on top of it. Again, as long as you keep an eye towards readability. You can also blend between images, right? So if I have multiple background images, which are usually separated in that background image declaration by commas, including gradients. So you can do a gradient in this as well. Uh, you can overlay two kittens on top of each other and create the stuff of nightmares. Or two kittens and a color. So you can actually layer all these things together and make some really usually cool, sometimes horrifying things. Palette cleanser, right? These, these are, these are uh, whew, stuff and nightmares. Let's go off that slide because I think everyone's freaking out about those kittens. Uh, so grid layout. Grid is my true love in terms of web design nowadays. I've been advocating for it since before it was in the browsers. I actually implemented it on my blog before it was actually officially supported in browsers. Uh, and I highly recommend that you go check it out today because it's actually really well supported. The browsers in the, in, the, in the span of like six months all implemented grid level one, which is unheard of in, in terms of like getting browsers to be on the same page about something. Uh, so you can see up the top right, the global support for grid is 93.77%. And I'm going to ignore the 1.5% that's in the light green. And that is Internet Explorer 11 and 10. And it's using an old version of the grid specification that doesn't really jive with, with the, uh, the modern version. And the reason that, that grid even exists is because of Microsoft and Internet Explorer. So for those of you who dog on Internet Explorer, maybe don't because they implemented grid first. They actually wanted to use it for their Metro design. They wanted those squares uh, to be prominent uh, on their web presence as well as in the Windows 8 experience. So they had to have something. Uh, grid also introduces a new terminology because we're actually, it's the first time we've had a first class layout uh, engine in the web. And so we have to think about uh, grid lines, grid cells, tracks, and areas. And so a line is literally just a vertical or a horizontal axis in terms of where we place our columns and our rows. 
A grid cell is the intersection between four adjacent grid lines. The grid track is the parallel space between two adjacent grid lines, which could be a row or a column. And then the grid area is the space inside of four non-adjacent intersecting grid lines. This is directly from the complete guide to grid on CSS tricks. So definitely check that out. It is just as comprehensive as the flex. And if you're looking for uh, syntax, it is one of the best places to go. So we're gonna take something very similar to what we saw before. We have a stack of tomato boxes on a light blue background. One is slightly larger than the others. And then we're going to make this in to a three column grid. And we're gonna use some new syntax. So we've got our container. It's always on the parent that we're doing these things. We change its context, display grid instead of display block. This is the same thing we did on the flex examples. And then we actually build out our columns and our rows. So in this case, we want three columns, one FR each. The FR unit is a CSS grid specific unit. It's the fractional space unit, and it divvies up the available white space in our layout amongst the items that have these values. And again, you can have this be like 1FR, 2FR, 1FR, 1FR, 2FR. You can do the same things you do with like the flex grow values, but you can do them in grid as well. Uh, and then you can also define out what sizes you want your rows to be. These can also be any, uh, any units you want. So you can mix and match pixels, FR units, VW units, you could even do percentages, even though I would highly recommend not doing percentages because the FR unit is way more powerful than a percentage ever will be. Uh, so in our case, we're going to say display grid. We're going to use three 1FR declarations, and that gives us three uh, fluidly responsive FR, uh, uh, columns in this area. And then we can use the grid gap property to allow there to be spacing in between our rows and our columns. You can specify specific ones around rows versus columns, or you can have them be the same unit. Now, really, really exciting in grid gap. Grid gap uh, is specifically for grid, but there's a new non-grid version coming. So there's just the gap property, which will uh, be useful in grid, but it's also coming to Flexbox. It's already in Firefox, I think, and it's in Chrome Canary right now. It's in the, the beta versions of Chrome. So that's coming, it's gonna make Flex super powerful as well. We'll never have to think about margins again in terms of doing these layouts. Super handy to have. So one of the things that gets me excited about grid is the idea of asymmetry in our layouts. So here we have what looks to be a very, very simple layout. And if we were to do this in Flex or in Floats, we could very easily do it. But we'd have like 13 lines of HTML to do it. And then on top of that, it's like three nested layers. And if you were to do this in say Bootstrap or Foundation, you'd probably even have like four or five or six nested layers to accomplish all this, right? We've got a left-hand column, which is gonna take up that full height. We've got a right-hand column. There has to be a columns div inside of that right-hand column. Just kind of a, a lot of markup for really just doing our layout. And it's even more CSS. It's about 31 lines of CSS to accomplish it. There's like three declarations of display flex. There's like just like contents everywhere. There's some calcs for our widths. There's some weird margin stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff that is really a pain in the butt. So we don't want to do that. We want to move into a grid solution. And to do that, we need to rethink the way we think about layout on the web. Instead of having our layout sized by our content, we can now have our content, or we now have our layout size the content. So the content in flex, the content in floats, sizes our layouts. In grid, we specify a layout and then our content flows into that. And the cool thing about it is instead of thinking in terms of containers, which we do in that content sizing model, we can have our markup be incredibly clean. Our promos div is now just one div, no sections, nothing else inside of it, and then four promo spots. Now the promo spots could be divs if you want them to be. They could have more markup inside them for actual content. But in this case, we're just gonna have four anchor tags as well. And then we're going to lay it out specifically on a grid. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna say, all right, display grid, change it to a grid context, and then set up our columns. So if you're coming from a bootstrap or a foundation, you're in a 12 column methodology. So you'd probably think like the left-hand side will be six, the right-hand side will be six, all that sort of thing. If you're kind of transitioning away from that, you'll think, all right, I need four columns. Left-hand side, right-hand side is two columns. In grid, we bake our asymmetry directly into our column declaration. So here, this layout is actually a three column grid. Left-hand side is one, right-hand side is two more, right? So two FR, one FR, one FR, meaning the left-hand side is twice as big as the, right, as the two right-hand columns. And then there's this two new properties right beneath that that I haven't talked about yet. Grid template areas 
allows us to name areas and actually stretch areas across multiple rows and columns. And then we can call that out and place the elements by name inside of that. So here we've got grid template areas. It takes a set of quotation marks and those quotation marks equal rows, right? So every set of quotation marks is going to be a new row in our layout. And then we identify the cells inside of it. So this is a three column grid. So there are three cells in the top row. The first one we're going to call main, and then the next two are called second. So that's telling the browser those two columns are both one area. And then we have a second row in those quotation marks. Uh, and then we call that main name again, and that's going to tell the browser to stretch our main column, our main area down two rows. So this is super awesome. This is like, horizontal and vertical two-dimensional layout at once. And then we toss a third and a fourth keyword over in those two right-hand bottom columns. Uh, and then we set a grid auto rows because grid automatically will add new rows as your content grows. Uh, we don't have to actually define out the template for our rows, but we do want to give it kind of some guidance around what it should do when it creates a new row. So I told it, have a min max value, a minimum and a maximum size. The minimum size should be about 20 VH, so about 20% of the browser's height, just to give us some good space to work with. And then the maximum size should be one FR, and that will allow our two rows or three rows or four rows to grow at the same rate. And then we provide grid gap to make sure that we have that equal spacing inside and not have to worry about margins and clearing margins and all that nonsense. So on the right-hand side of this code, we also have our placement CSS because grid is automatically going to try to place things in one cell. So we have to tell it where to go. So the first child, we're gonna say, go into grid area main, and that's going to automatically place it along two rows in that first column. Nth child two gets second, which is automatically gonna place it in the two columns side by side in the first row. And then third and fourth, will go into those third and fourth rows. So in general, third and fourth here are actually unnecessary because grid will automatically flow content into the third and fourth area. Uh, but for me, I like to be explicit so that six months down the road, I remember what I'm looking at. But if you're all about line lengths, what this gives us is basically 50% of the markup, 50% of the CSS, all to do that asymmetric, low, uh, that asymmetric uh, promo area uh, much more easily, right? So it's super, uh, so in chat I see, is it like anonymous variables, but not? Yes. The non-technical answer would be yes. You're basically creating new uh, keywords that you can then use wherever you need to inside of this area. So there's a whole lot more out there in terms of CSS Grid. I kind of just scratched the surface. This is like an overview, right? So uh, we've got Rachel Andrew and Jen Simmons both represented here. They are some of the key people that wrote the spec and they're some of the early um, educators around it. Rachel Andrews has a site called Grid by Example. Super handy to see how all the properties play together. Jen Simmons has a YouTube channel called Layout Land, all about CSS layout in general. CSSGrid.io is actually Wes Boss's course on CSS Grid. It is free because Mozilla, I think, backed up a bank, uh, you know, bank truck to him to, to get him to make it free. Uh, you've got my course, which is actually practicalcssgrid.com. It's two hours long, and you can find out all you need about Grid there. Uh, the CSS Tricks Complete Guide to Grid, as well as uh, Jen Simmons has a website, uh, a subdomain or site, lab.jensimmons.com, and it's a whole bunch of her like meditations on weird layout on the web. All things are, are super awesome there. So I'm gonna cleanse our palette one more time uh, before I take questions. I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for questions as well. We're gonna talk about CSS shapes because I, I kind of was rough on floats before. Floats still serve an, a very important purpose on the web. If you have an image and you wanna wrap text around it, floats are the only things that are gonna do that for you. So they're not evil. They just only have one use case and now we can only use them for one use case because we have flex and because we have uh, grid. So let's make those floating images interesting again with CSS shapes. Very important to note, again, just like in our blend modes, not supported in IE or the old versions of Edge, only supported in Chromium Edge, as well as full support in Firefox, Chrome, Safari. So it's super awesome. We can use it in all of those uh, there. So let's take a, a simple example. We have a circle in our image, right? And then it has this hard edge around it, right? We float it left and the text wraps around it and that's great, but it's a square in terms of that hard edge. So before we would say, all right, this is good enough, call it a day. But now we can use a property called shape outside and we can actually specify a few different things we can do with it. So very easily we can have our text actually flow around in a circular shape around our circle. So we have all that same stuff and then we just add shape outside circle and we get it. Super awesome, super easy. We can also do polygons. So you can have this kind of wiggly edge on the left-hand side, which is super fun. The code looks something like this. 
Uh, we set a width and a height on it so that it can actually be defined there. And then we use shape outside polygon. I would never write this polygon code by hand. Uh, if you look up uh, clip path or CSS shapes clippy, uh, you can see the links right there, bennettfeely.com slash clippy. This is actually a really great tool for actually designing out your polygons, both for clip path and for CSS shapes. So you can do some really cool stuff in there. You can also have your own smiling face and upper torso represented and have the text wrap around that by using the shape outside URL. And the URL is gonna go to an image that is a transparent mask of what you want the text to wrap around. So in this case, it is a black version of my entire silhouette here. And then I provide a shape margin to allow it to kind of bump out from my body just a little bit there. So super cool, you get my smiling face, text wrapping around it. Cool for like doing some editorial workflows and doing some like cool new things on your sites. You can also have it kind of squish in like this. There's, there's a specification coming to shape inside, but I don't think it's anywhere close to recommendation yet. Uh, so you can use shape outside to put this together. And you can have two items, a left and a right one, be polygons and squish the text in like this. So you can have some really cool looking things, CSS, all without too much worry. So I highly recommend that you explore more. There's, there's so much more in the CSS world that I can cover in 45 minutes. Initial letters, the cool specification that you can actually do some cool stuff with the first letter of text. You can make it like span multiple lines instead of doing height. You can use CSS transforms for more than just animations. You can do like skews and rotates and three dimensional things. Object fit brings the background size cover and the idea of like placing a background image to foreground images. It's super cool. Uh, CSS filters bring a whole bunch of like Photoshop filter kind of things like grayscale and like really wacky stuff you can use uh, into the browser. Clip path is a way of actually like clipping out uh, a, an image or even a div with text inside of it to actually have a shape on your site as well. I want to close for questions and say, there's no shame in using templates. There's no shame in using Bootstrap or Bulma or Foundation, but understand what these things do and how to break out of it when you need to and how to do little things on your own. Because CSS is super powerful. If you learn a few things, you can make super interesting designs and you can start today. Uh, you don't have to wait for 100% adoption because that would actually be kind of terrible to wait for because you never get there because plenty of people are still using IE10. Uh, but you want to fall back with an idea of support first, right? So start from a point of support and go forward. And we can do that with CSS feature queries uh, to allow for us to support browsers that support these things without resorting to JavaScript. So in our CSS, this is from our asymmetric grid example from before, we could actually have a flex layout as our basic layout. And this flex layout would get us two boxes side by side and then two boxes side by side with a little bit of margin. And then inside of what we call a feature query, which looks a lot like a media query, but with the word supports, uh, it says supports display grid. So this says for any browser that supports grid, do this other code. And the important thing to note here is we unset two properties, right? So we unset width 100% or we unset our width calculation from our promo to make it 100% because grid actually changes the context of its children to have percentages be percentage of the area as opposed to percentage of the parent. And then margin bottom, we get rid of that so we can use gap and set. And then it's just the rest of our grid code inside of that. So look up feature queries, work with feature queries. It's a way of, of having resilient web design as Jen Simmons calls it, or as I like to say, support for CSS. Uh, so a little bit of homework for you before I take questions. Go learn one of these new layout things today and one of these new style things today, and then tell me on Twitter what you picked. Whatever you want picked, right? Send me a message at brob, at brob. Let me know what you picked uh, to, to learn. I'm also always willing to help. That's not me, that's my child from like two years ago, but it's still an adorable picture. I'd love to help you learn these things. Go to brianlrobinson.com. There's a uh, free advice button you can click and you can get a little bit of my time that way. Hit me up on Twitter, at brob. I also stream code. I uh, used to be daily, but with COVID-19, it's a little bit less than that, uh, at twitch.tv uh, slash Brian L. Robinson. And now I'll take questions, uh, if we have questions. We do. Uh, awesome. uh, I think, do you need to stop sharing, I think? Be the... OK, I can do that. I can show my awesome face again here. Heck yeah. <laughs> there we go. All Let's right. see how this works. Uh, so first, and this, this is uh, more of an aside, uh, will the slides that you presented sure. be available? Uh, yes, uh, I've got them as a PDF somewhere and I'll send them to the Tech Oklahoma crew and, and we'll get them up. Cool, we'll, we'll, we'll ship them out. 
Um, okay, uh, first question uh, from KM Farrier. Uh, what's a good place to test sites in various browser versions? So there, there are multiple tools to do this. Um, there are two companies that I, I don't necessarily say I recommend, but that I've used, and they're, they're as good as it gets, I think. Uh, there's, uh, I've forgotten one, there's cross-browser testing, which is actually a Memphis-based company, so all sorts of support there. And they literally have buckets of hardware sitting at their office. So they have got virtual, virtualized machines, but they also have the hardware attached to various things too. And you can actually basically drill into various images of uh, like old school PCs, old school Macs to test everything. Um, if you're worrying about really old school stuff, I'd, I'd say like make sure you're using that fall forward mechanism using the feature queries, but that cross browser testing and browser stack, I think is the other one. They're both paid services. They're both, they're both good for what they are. They're a little slow because you're literally tunneling into somebody else's machine, uh, but they work really well and they allow you to test on native hardware, which is also super important. Gotcha. Uh, okay, uh, Thutry and Thel, uh, what are some good, what are some of your favorite creations or examples of grid layouts? Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of different stuff out there. Um, I've got another presentation that's all about grid, uh, but there's, there's somebody like built the Daily Prophet, like newspaper from Harry Potter in grid layout. Look up labs.jensimmons.com. She's got a whole bunch of cool stuff in grid. Uh, look up a CSS Tricks article called Five Design, Four Design Fears, Five Design Fears to Squash with CSS Grid. Spoiler alert, I wrote it. Uh, and it's got some some really interesting things because I did like a punk rock meditation. It's like, does the web need to be usable? And it plays with overlap. And like, there's uh, I did one that was like a home page that had like white space built in because Grid gives us the ability to have like vertical white space in interesting ways. Uh, so that's a, a really interesting article. Um, Jen Simmons is is the place to go for like finding out more about this stuff. She is she's my hero. She's on Twitter uh, and she's got the four one one on all that. Or hit me up on Twitter and I'll like send links and stuff like that. We'll figure it out. And this is a follow up from the same uh, user. Um, yep. Basically, they, they're letting you know that they agree that uh, Grid is more powerful than Flex. Uh, is there a time where you might still use Flexbox over Grid? 100%. So, uh, not to get on too big of a soap, uh, soapbox, I know that we've got like 10 minutes and I want to make sure there are plenty of time for other questions, but there are five layout mechanisms inside of CSS. Right, we've got floats, which are harped on as being awful, but again, they have one use case. If I see you using them for a different use case, I will find you. Um, you've got flex, grid, multi-column, and positioning. And they all serve purposes to make one big cohesive layout mechanism for the web. So floats are that one use case, text wrapping around an image or like a video or something like that. Um, multi-column is a very interesting specification where you can actually say uh, column count three, and you get three columns and you have text, they will actually wrap around those columns. Flex and grid don't really do that. I could hack that together in flex, but it wouldn't work great. Multi-column is fully supported and all that and has some interesting sub properties as well. So that's one use case. Um, then flex is unidirectional. So it's either a row or a column. And then it's also best for content sized items. So uh, Rachel Andrews is actually the one that, that started talking about this this way first. She said, if you want your content to size your layout, flex is the answer. If you want your layout to size your content, grid is the answer. And so what, what it is basically like a navigation is a great example of a flex use case. I've got one row. I want those items to, to stack independently and squish independently. Uh, and so I want their content to size them. I want for as long as possible, all my navigational items to remain on one row and to not squish in weird ways. So that is the content size in the layout. Uh, in fact, there's a everylayout.dev, which is a really cool uh, ebook slash website by Andy Bell and Hayden Pickering. Uh, and they talk about it's the stack or the cluster, uh, the, the cluster uh, component. And it's all about flex and it's all about the cool things you can do with flex. So content sizing is the number one key for flex. And then grid, when you want two dimensional control, rows and columns at the same time, use grid. When you want your layout to be hard coded into your design, into your CSS, grid's the answer to that as well. I think, oh, and then positions, right? So position relative, position absolute, position fixed, position sticky, position static. When you want to take an item and just shift it a little bit, that's what position relative is for, right? You bump it over five pixels. When you want to remove an item from the flow of the page, 
position absolute or position fix is going to pull it out and let all the other content flow up underneath it. You can't do that with grid or flex or any of these other things. So all five of these mechanisms are important in making a good website. Thank you. It, mm -hmm. Your your float mentioning gave me like clear fix nightmares from the past. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, next up, we've got uh, from uh, Quincy. Uh, does flex and grid not limit your creativity in website designing? The all so grid specifically blows the doors off creativity for website design. So. I worked at an agency for six and a half years. And by the end of it, I was overseeing our design development team. Uh, when we started supporting Grid, it's completely off the leash. Because you know, designers have, have been thinking long-term, I have 12 columns, they're all this size. My margins are always gonna be this, this way. I can't do any sort of weird like vertical spacing without giving the developers too much of a headache. Grid gets rid of a lot of that. Uh, the only thing that Grid, Flexbox, Floats, Positioning, uh, and multi-column can't do in terms of creativity on the web together is the idea of the mosaic tiling, the Pinterest layout, which is like the new holy grail layout of the web. Uh, they don't do that out of the box. You still need JavaScript to do that. Uh, but Grid actually, there's new specification being written for a level two or three Grid module to actually take into effect a mosaic tiling effect, which is gonna be super cool. Uh, Mozilla is pushing on that right now. Um, but Literally, like when we told our designers that they could do almost anything they wanted to, we did so much. And there was so much stuff that we couldn't, we could have done in the past, but it would have taken hours. Those things then took 30 minutes doing the layout instead of three hours on one small component. So I think it blows the door on the creativity. I think it makes everything possible. I, I got a lot, a lot of crap from, from my team because er, very early on I said, we are gods of the internet, we can do anything. Uh, and they, they rub that in my face a lot. But we really, like, anything is possible uh, with the tools available. Yeah, I'm realizing we have pretty similar backgrounds, and <laughs> I we can swap some good stories. Um, oh, yeah. uh, I think we've got time for one more question, if anyone has it. Uh, okay. And that's, I, I walked through everything that was, that was submitted. And I'll say I'll be uh, in and out of the Techlahoma Slack like today, but also I'll just hang out in the Slack for ever because that's how Slack works, right? Uh, and so, so hit me up in there on Twitter. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions about this because I love talking about it in case you couldn't tell. Certainly. Oh, uh, Memphis barbecue, favorite spot? Uh, Central barbecue in Memphis is the, is the best pulled pork barbecue in Memphis. And the best sauce in Memphis is a place called the Barbecue Shop. And they're both amazing. Uh, but you have to pay extra for pulled pork at the barbecue shop, whereas it's just the way Central Barbecue does. Copy that. I sure appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, thank you again from from all of us at Declahoma and everyone. Uh, we definitely appreciate your time and thanks for talking. And yeah, we'll we'll hit, hit you up on uh, on Slack. Awesome. Thank you very much. Take care. <laughs>